I work on analysis, broadly mm -hmm. speaking, usually spectral theory, calculus of variations, often on problems in statistical mechanics. But today I don't want to talk about that really. I want to talk about multivariate trace inequalities for two reasons. One, that they don't require a lot of setup. It's just matrices. And uh, two, uh, I think they're a useful tool in sort of a vi wide variety of analytical contexts. And who knows, maybe you'll find them useful one day. Okay. So uh, there'll be full slides, but there'll be only four. OK. <laughs> oh, it's cut off. OK, so if I had to summarize them in one sentence, I would say trace inequalities usually relate traces of various products of Hermitian matrices and relate in the sense of an inequality. OK? Typically, these, uh, inequalities become, these inequalities become equalities for commuting matrices. They're usually easy if things commute. And in some sort of high level sense, perhaps they allow one to quantify certain non commutative aspects of these matrix products if they come under a trace. This, this is the two important ingredients. One, it's an inequality, so some controlling things is not an equality typically. And it has to be, on average, somehow inside the trace. Then one can usually say more than somehow just direct computation of the matrices would, would tell one. Here's somehow one of the most prototypical trace inequalities. It's due to Golden and Thompson independently in 1965. So you just take two m by m Hermitian matrices. And the size m is, in the, is sort of irrelevant for the rest of this. Just think of m as some huge number. Um, and then we all know that in general, e to the a plus b is not the same as e to the a times e to the b if the matrices don't commute. Now, there's in fact a, a big formula that you can write for expressing this in terms of this up to some other factors. That's called the Baker Campbell Hausdorff formula, or sometimes Tussenhaus analog of it. But that's a very long formula, and actually, convergence of that formula is not always trivial and so on. Instead, if you take the trace one and you only care about inequalities two, things become much simpler. As you can see, right? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It is. Right. Yes. Is there a mission? <laughs> That's why her mission. Yeah. Um, good. Okay. So um, this inequality has lots of applications. Golden and Thompson came from statistical mechanics. That's where it originated, but it's also found applications in quantum information theory and in random matrix theory. <coughs> and some of the talk will be about multivariate trace inequalities, where the goal is to put more matrices up here. Okay, not just two, more. Why would that be useful? Just as one example of an application of this stuff, it turns a sum of matrices into a product, right? If we think about somehow one way to prove the central limit theorem, it's good to take Fourier transforms because they take the sum of independent variables into a product, then you can use independence. But if you want to do that for matrices, you can't in general. But if you take a trace and you only care about an inequality, it gives you something. And that's why these kind of things can be useful for large deviations principles. We want to take an exponential of things. That's just a sort of rough motivation. I won't be talking much about applications, just because I want to go through some of the results. But just to have that in the back of your head, for random matrices, for example, these inequalities can be quite useful. OK, so now, how to generalize this? OK, this uh, is actually, the, to show that this is a subtle question on the next slide, there are a few generalizations that are false. OK, this is the most naive guess, perhaps. Right? That's sort of trivially false. Because this is a positive definite matrix. This is positive. But this is, in general, not a positive definite matrix. The product of two positive definite matrices need not be positive definite. You might say, aha, but what about up there? That's not positive definite then. Well, there, I can write as e to the a over 2 times e to the a over 2 and use cyclicity to move one of the e to the a over 2 to the other side. So that right-hand side is actually always positive. Just don't see it the way I've written it. You might say, OK, well, you tell me that's the enemy now. So I just fix that problem and write it like this. The symmetrized thing is now positive just by the same argument I gave up there. Inequality is still false, though, just in this case by an explicit counterexample. OK, so it's a little bit subtle. And in 76, Elliot Lieb, who's sitting over there, uh, proved a three matrix extension of this. And it features some kind of, I mean, you should think of this object, which maybe isn't, looks a little strange at first sight, 
as some kind of non-commutative way of averaging b on the left and on the right. Some kind of symmetric way of distributing b on the left and on the right. And it's also, if you just count homogeneity, this thing is essentially, if things were to commute, this would be e to the b times e to the c. Okay. So tau is a real number that I'm integrating over from 0 to infinity, and i is the identity matrix. Okay. So these are some kind of resolvents that appear now of positive objects. So this is a, the good generalization of this golden Thompson to three matrices. And sometimes on the bottom there are some remarks about the proofs, but I won't somehow, they just if you want to read them. You say yeah. Oh, the, this representation theorem for, I mean, it's kind of like a Herglotz representation theorem for, po uh, for matrix convex functions. Yeah, I yeah, know, I mean, fair enough. The, this, these things are not supposed meant to be sort of very complete. Yeah? Can one understand the piece why the integral is positive? Well, the, so it's again, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by positive, why this whole thing is positive. I can write this again as e to the a over 2, put it over here, and then I have a positive definite matrix. Right. Does that answer? Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? No. Okay. So then the next question is what about four or more? <laughs> okay. And again, this will be useful to have. I mean, this inequality was used uh, in quantum information theory to prove what's called the strong subadditivity of entropy for those who know. But again, having it for more matrices would probably be helpful depending on the form of the inequality for these large deviations principles for a random matrices. So it's also motivated by applications. What about more? And so this was, I mean, there were, there were partial results, but essentially a, a nice general form. This was open until last year. And there was a very nice breakthrough result, which I can say because it's not mine. And it's on the next slide. It's a little bit bigger because you have n matrices, but it's actually quite nice. So these guys, three guys, Zotta, Bertha, Toma, Michel, they come from quantum information theory, and they needed an extension to four matrices. And here's what they proved. Let's go through this. So n is bigger than 2, and n is the number of matrices. So previously it was 2 and 3. Take n Hermitian matrices. That's the usual left-hand side. I just take the exponential of their sum. And now here's what they get. So what happens is, you remember, there was always this one half on either side in this counterexample. Right, e to the b over 2, e to the b over 2. And what happens is they come to the side with the e to the 1 half, but then there's also a complex phase. e to the 1 plus i t over 2, e to the 1 minus i t over 2. And because I'm conjugating by unitaries, I still get something positive. And I do this for all the ones in between, a2 up to a n minus 1, and then I close with e to the a n. OK, the parameter t is averaged over with some explicit probability density. It's a very nice result. Now you might say, OK, you say there's an extension of Leap's inequality, but it looks quite different for n equal 3. There's a complex number. There's an integral over it. The other one had resolvents. But it actually, by just the computation of two integrals, turns out that they're the same for n equal to 3, the right-hand sides. Sorry? Presumably, why is it sharp? I mean, it's the right function. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. They, they have some, sorry? Well, these things are always equalities if things commute, and then beta doesn't matter. But what they do also in their paper is they have counterexamples show that beta can't be much sharper or much flatter as a probability distribution. So is there anything unique about it? Uh, I mean, it comes out of uh, a complex interpolation argument. I mean, it's, somewhat, it's a very rigid object. It comes from the Poisson kernel, essentially. But I mean, I don't know if there's something really unique about it. I mean. In principle, the result, given the counterexamples we have, could hold for slightly different beta, but it, it's already pretty delicate. So, yeah. I mean, it's not fully understood either. I mean, there might be something unique about it that we just don't know or I don't know. OK, good. So they were really motivated by the n equal to 4 case, which is the first new inequality. And they used that in quantum information theory to prove something that strengthens the strong subadditivity of entropy. So there's this big inequality, and there's this inequality for n equal to 3. And I now want to talk about their relation. Okay. 
Any questions about this slide? No? Okay. This is the last slide. This is somehow about, right, there was this inequality. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's actually, again, because I can write this. I'm just lazy. I don't split it always up. No, I can write no, this. No, 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 oh. no, I'm not talking about that. Ah, I see about what you're saying. Ways yes. The AI is going I to see. That. Yes. That's a very good point, actually. I should have made that point earlier. This side is invariant under permuting the A's. Yes. This side is not. This side is not. Okay. So I can apply this for any other permutation of the A's. I get a different inequality. That's a very good point. Yeah. Which is also true for the three cases. Which is also true for all the other cases, because the left hand side is always symmetric under permutations. And the, the, the right-hand side is not as soon as n is bigger or equal to 3. One can do that, yeah. Yeah. I mean, in the applications, it's actually quite important which one goes where. OK? But it's true. That's a good point. Thanks. OK. So now I want to talk about the relation between these two things. So we have this one with all the complex phases and this parameter beta, and this one with the resolvents. Okay, and so the question is now, is there a form of these, I call them SBT, this was the big inequality with the complex numbers on the last slide, is there a form of these inequalities that uses resolvents for n bigger than 3? Can it be re rewritten as an n bigger than 3 generalization of this inequality by leap? And this is not just an academic question, for basically for the reason in a nutshell that resolvents are nicer objects to work with than complex matrix powers. Resolvents, we have lots of algebraic identities for their commutators or for their perturbations. They're really nice objects to work with. And so the hope is that if there's a version of that inequality, that it will allow one to get rid of the following nuisance in that inequality. It's the e to the it ak over 2. These are unitaries because the ak's are Hermitian. And I can really pull them out, of course. Just let me go back. Of course, this thing, because these two things, e to the a2 over 2 and e to the it a2 over 2, commute. So I can pull the unitary part out always, right? And so there's all these unitaries in between, and they're kind of a nuisance in applications right now. Um, and some just, I just wrote two sample applications that we might have in mind, usually to random matrix theory because of this property of this theorem that it turns a sum of uh, matrices, think of them as independent, into a product. OK, and so bounds on the Lyapunov exponents are maybe one of the more exciting potential applications if we can get rid of the unitaries. Okay. Now, getting rid of the unitaries is not completely trivial. Of course, they have to be there in some capacity because we know the inequality fails if all the unitaries are gone. So we really want to result if all the matrices approximately commute, then I can write this inequality as the one without unitaries plus an error term. That's really what I mean. Just think that sort of with a little asterisk when I say get rid of the unitaries. Anyway, so this was just a little note I published two months ago, which just basically answers this question with a yes. Okay? Which, which it's, it's just an identity. It essentially, it rewrites this right-hand side in terms of results for every n. And because the expressions are kind of complicated for n bigger than 4, I just wrote the n equal to 4 case here. So it gives you the following inequality. I take a trace of a sum of four matrices. And little sub h means there's a Hilbert space. There's one space here. And here, the trace on the right-hand side is now over the tensor product. And it's the tensor product of this expression. So it looks pretty similar to this expression that, uh, that Lieb had, but just with tensor products down here, down here, and up there. And there's a projector you have to put in, which I don't want to discuss. Traces there. You mean, you mean the oh, sorry. This is gone. Sorry. There's a typo. Typo. My bad. This, this is right. Yeah. Thank you. OK. <laughs> I, I will stop holding it now. OK. So, so I mean, in the, the bottom line is one can generalize this inequality in a resolvent form. And now, what's, sort of what's up next is to try to work on these applications. And I mean, it's all the expressions are kind of big because they're general non-commuting matrices. But still, there's some hope now to, to get rid of these unitaries under some assumptions. So yeah, that's, that's all I wanted to say. Thanks for listening.